Hi, folks. Are, are we live? OK. Hi, everyone. My name's Michael Lucas. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, I write technology books, a whole bunch of them. Uh, and I've been using Unix since sometime in the 1980s. I forget the exact year. Uh, I've been a sysadmin since 95. And I now make my living uh, writing about all the things I learned the hard way uh, as a sysadmin. I'm a founding member of semibug.org, the Southeast Michigan BSD user group. They meet one week after the mug meeting. So it's very easy to remember. Just come on over to Altair Engineering. And uh, I'm here tonight uh, because of ZFS. Uh, Alan Jude and I wrote a couple books on ZFS. And uh, I should probably also mention uh, my new books are SSH Mastery and, of course, Ed Mastery. Remember, Ed is the standard Unix editor. Uh, as Michael Warren Lucas, I write novels like Git Commit Murder, but sadly, uh, Michael Warren is best known for his cutting edge work in Linux Erotica. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's talk about ZFS. What is ZFS? Is anyone here using ZFS? OK, a, a few of you, good. ZFS is a modern, fully featured file system. And by that, I mean it has things that we've wanted for decades in other file systems, such as built-in integrity checking. Snapshots are built in from the ground up. ZFS was created by Sun, and some of you may remember Sun open sourced it, and then Oracle bought Sun, and darkness descended upon mankind. <laughs> uh, fortunately, although Oracle pulled ZFS back and closed the source, once it was open, it's out there. The, the open ZFS project is now the source, the, the central coordinator of all things ZFS. And updates and improvements are fed from OpenZFS down into all of the operating systems that use it. So the ZFS on Linux project, FreeBSD, Canonical, etc., all get their ZFS implementations from OpenZFS. Some of these projects do their own improvements on ZFS and will feed them back upstream and they, it gets distributed out to all the projects. So there's a very active development environment and community for ZFS. So What makes ZFS special? When I say it's fully featured, what, what does that mean? What that means is it uses very well understood technologies and puts them together in a seamless whole to take advantage of all the things we know about file systems and data today. So we have checksums. Everybody uses checksums. Every packaging system uses checksums. But by putting them in the file system, you can test and verify the integrity of data in the file system. So that you know, if a stray cosmic ray hits your disk, ZFS notices and can fix it. It has very sophisticated metadata. Uh, compression, there, there's really no need to gzip your log files anymore because ZFS transparently compresses for you. 
ZFS even has some parts of diff. You can examine the differences between two different versions of a file system. And by combining all of this, all these well understood techniques, uh, it creates something greater than the sum of its parts. And I would like to again thank Gib for free root beer. Life is good. <laughs> And we, we've all seen how, all, how disparate parts can come together to create something stronger. Uh, for example, if I can get Brian up here, we'll, we can demonstrate. No? Ah, uh, no. Okay. The one thing that might be new to you is this phrase, copy on write. So... What is that? ZFS never changes a written disk sector. If data that is on a sector is changed, ZFS allocates a new sector and writes the data to that. And then it deallocates the unused sector. This means that the data on the disk is always coherent. You never have a, a half-written block. If you get a power loss halfway through the write and the write cache runs out of juice and lightning strikes or whatever, the data on the disk is a coherent file system. Maybe you didn't save what wasn't written to disk, but nothing's going to save what's not written to disk. And an interesting, well, th this is really no different than you copying a file before you edit and make changes. It, it's sort of version control at the disk level. And an interesting effect of this is you get effectively free snapshots, which we'll talk about in a bit. But before we go deeper, let, let's discuss how you need to think about ZFS. ZFS is not EXTFS. It's not UFS. It is not XFS. If you treat it just like UFS, somehow it will bite you. You, you need to know what it is you're doing and how ZFS works. That, that's not hard, but a little bit of reading will save you a lot of pain. Non-ZFS tools like Dump might appear to work. They don't, but they might look like it. It's much like switching from, uh, anyone remember S51K? File systems before UFS. We treated UFS very differently than we treated those old file systems. ZFS is the same kind of change. So ZFS hardware, you'll see a lot of gossip and discussion on the internet about what hardware you should have for ZFS, but these are really the essentials. Don't use a RAID controller. ZFS expects to talk to the disk. It ex ZFS will actually read information from the disk and it will notify you if it's getting bad sectors on the disk. And the RAID controllers hide all of that. Uh, some RAID controllers say that they can give you raw disk access what they might call JBOD mode or just a bunch of disks. Often what they really do is they create one disk RAID containers in their own proprietary format and they hide all of the performance information that ZFS is expecting. So look carefully if, if you're using a RAID controller, check carefully, make sure you're actually getting disks and not some vendor proprietary 
who knows what that it's passing off as a disc. Another subject of discussion is ECC RAM. There are people who will say you must have ECC RAM for ZFS. Well, the question is, where does the cosmic ray hit? Does it hit the memory or does it hit the disk? So a, a host running ZFS without ECC RAM is no worse than any more traditional file system with ECC RAM. The question is, where is the checksumming taking place? Now, if you can get ECC RAM and you can checksum everywhere, certainly do that. I, I would never argue against ECC RAM. And one of the advantages of ZFS is it, it is extremely redundant. It has all kinds of redundancy built in. Hardware redundancy only works if you have more than one hard drive. So for a server, I would encourage you to have multiple hard drives. And there are, there are ways you can work around a laptop, but we'll get to those. So some ZFS terminology and language. Uh, a VDEV, or a virtual device, is a group of storage providers, disks. A pool is a group of identical virtual devices. A data set is a named chunk of data on a pool. It could be a file system. It could be a block device for a virtual machine. It could be a snapshot. It could be any number of things. It's just a named lump of data. Am I moving around too much? No. Okay. Uh, and you can arrange data in your pool any way you want. One other thing to remember on ZFS and the, the ZFS tools is the minus F flag is important. It's dangerous and anytime you come across minus F you should think hard and thoroughly before typing that. And then you shouldn't type that. And minus F stands for? Minus F stands for force. And we'll, we'll oh, talk I about it. Another... Yeah. <laughs> there, there are more slides. That the, the minus F point is worth hammering home twice in this talk. Because the, one of the most common a uh, message you'll, you'll see on forums and mailing lists is, I used minus F and now my life is terrible. <laughs> yes, it is. You used minus F. So, a virtual device. A virtual device is the basic unit of storage in ZFS. All redundancy happens at the virtual device level. So you can have a group of three hard drives in a virtual device. You can have three SSDs, five, ten, however many. You lump these together, and that makes a virtual device. And most commonly, these are just a raw disk. They can be a GPT partition. If you're on FreeBSD, I'm, I'm a FreeBSD bigot, as it said right up front, so deal. Um, we have a stackable file system, so it could be a crypto device, uh, it could be an LLVM RAID, uh, I wouldn't, but it could be. If, if possible, put it right on the raw disk, and I'm going to call these disks even though they might not be in your deployment. So. How do, how do these virtual devices tie to pools? Basically, a pool can only contain one type of VDEV. You can put 200 VDEVs in a pool, but they all have to be the same type. So you'll hear an X VDEV, a type X VDEV and a type X pool get thrown around interchangeably. 
they, they really aren't interchangeable, but if you say, I have a RAID Z pool, people will understand what you mean. You add virtual devices to pools. You generally don't add providers to virtual devices. That is, once you have your, your virtual device of three disks, it stays three disks forever. <coughs> One of my personal favorite type of VDEV is the Stripe. Each disk, uh, sorry, no, that, uh, I misspoke. My personal least favorite type of pool is the Stripe. My apologies. Each disk is its own virtual device. And data is just striped across all of the virtual devices. You can add more virtual devices to the pool. And there is zero redundancy. There is no self-healing. And if any one of these devices fail, the entire pool collapses and dies. Stripe is fine if you're, say, in a computing cluster and you need a great big scratch space. And you don't care if it dies because the whole job has to be restarted anyway, so who cares? Uh, a lot of people, if you're using ZFS on your laptop, most laptops only have one disk. You're stuck with stripes. Uh, you can set the pool copies property to get self-healing, which we'll talk about later, but that will not protect you against hardware failure. Mirrors. Mirrors are my favorite. And th this is where each virtual device has multiple disks, and all the disks are copies of each other. So this, this is a good old-fashioned RAID mirror. The nice thing with ZFS is if you want to convert your mirror to a RAID 10, striping on top of mirrors, you just add another identical virtual device. And ZFS will say, oh, I have more space. And RAID 10 is delightfully fast. It's wonderful for databases. And you can just pile on virtual devices until you run out of server. RAID Z is where ZFS starts to go off in its own special direction. Each virtual device contains multiple disks, at least three. Data integrity is constantly checked by parity, much like RAID 5. If you lose a disk in the VDEV, there's no data loss and the pool can heal itself via its redundant checksums. A RAID Z pool can have multiple identical VDEVs. If you have a virtual device of five disks, and you can keep adding lumps of five disks forever. You may have to buy a, you know, external storage controllers and daisy chain them together and get some power strips, but the disks are fine. One important thing is you cannot expand the size of the virtual device. When you start with a five disk virtual device, it is five disks forever. There is work going on to be able to make that happen, but uh, who knows when we're going to see that. For, for the foreseeable future, constant number of disks per VDEV. There's three types of RAID Z. RAID Z1, single parity, three or more disks, and you can lose one disk per VDEV. RAID Z2, four or more disks. You lose two disks to parity, you can lose up to two disks without data loss. And, and I think some of you are starting to see the trend here. RAID Z3, five or more disks. Three disks are used for parity. So that, that's triple parity. And 
there are reasons these days to have triple parity. Uh, one, disk size far exceeds the, the throughput you get to the disk. We have, I, I haven't been to Micro Center lately. Uh, how big are hard drives now? 10 terabytes? To, I, I mean, my, my laptop has a terabyte, and I'm nowhere near filling this thing. So, and yet we're, we're still at SATA 3 speeds. You can write data to that disk, and it, it won't be seen again until who knows when. So, there, there are a couple of interesting research papers showing that there's a really good chance that if one of your disks fails and you have to rebuild parity, which means walking all of the disk or all of the disk that has data on it, you may find another flaw in another drive and lose that drive. So, uh, and the math says that for really large pools, RAID Z3 is a, a serious, should be in serious consideration for your data. So, you have all this flexibility, what do you do with it? Because you might say, I have a 100 disk array I'm going to RAID Z3 it and have, you know, just lose three disks to parity. And I'm going to have a huge amount of space. Just, just infinite, infinite living space. And it, it's not quite that simple. In general, don't put more than 9 to 12 disks in a VDEV. Pool size really is a matter of hot debate. Go to a conference where there is heavy, heavy ZFS use. Go to the bar. <laughs> Walk up to someone and ask, how big should a pool be? Out in the Old West, they called this game, let's you and him fight. So sit back, watch the fun. On my servers... I put the operating system in a mirrored pool. If, if it's very high availability, I will uh, add a third disk to that mirror just to be sure. Uh, and then I'll put data in separate pools depending on the data. This is where you look at your application and try to make an intelligent guess at what this horrible piece of software is going to do to your innocent server. <laughs> and to be fair, the database admins don't know either. They're making their best guess. So, ZFS versus, or ZFS RAID Z versus traditional RAID. You Uh, ZFS is combining a file system and a volume manager, which means that ZFS knows what data has been written, and it only has to reconstruct that. Your traditional uh, RAID controller will only w rewrites the entire disk, even if the disk is 90% empty. Now. Some RAID cards have proprietary extensions that only copy data, and this means they, they have to have some awareness of your file system, and this is all proprietary vendor crud, and there are people who say that's fine. There are people who hate it. Uh, I, am, I, I do not have the time to come up here and, and go on a soapbox one way or the other, so I'm, I'm not going to speak any particular opinion about uh, whether you should have this proprietary stuff. So, and, and the rebuilding happens because of copy on write, which it knows what blocks have been written and it only writes new blocks. 
So, uh, how do you actually use this? It, in our example, I've labeled my disks. And if you're not familiar with BSD, each of these disk devices I list here, uh, there's, a sl there's a implicit slash dev in front of them. So these are GPT labels. I use the zpool create command. And here I'm, I'm making a striped pool. It's disposable. Whatever I throw in can rot. So the zpool create command. I'm calling my, my disposable data compost. And I've added these three disk devices to it. And that's it. Here's the pool. Here's what I want. Here's the type of pool. Here's the name, and this is what you put in it. And what you get, the zpool status command shows you all of your pools. Our pool compost is online. It shows each of the disks. Uh, any errors? Creating mirrors is much, much like it, except for the, the mirror keyword here shows that where our pool is called reflect. It's a mirrored pool. Here are two storage providers. And again, zpool status. We have our pool, virtual device name, mirror zero, and there are the members. Now, RAID Z pools, you have to use the keyword for the type of RAID Z pool you're making. But otherwise, it, it's very similar. This is a RAID Z1 pool with three disks. So, and once you, you figure out how to read one type of pool, they're pretty much all the same. Where things get fun is when you have multiple VDEVs. There's, all you do is you use the type keyword multiple times. So here we're, we're creating a pool called VAT. There's a RAID Z1, and it has these three devices. The RAID Z1 keyword again says, this is a new VDEV, and here are the three devices for that. And so you can look at the pool and see exactly that. We have our first VDEV and our second VDEV and the members of each VDEV in the pool. So when we get to errors, you'll be able to see exactly what virtual devices have the error and where they are, uh, where the problems are. Re remember when I said minus F force was bad? This is exactly what I mean. Here I'm creating a pool. It's called Dafty. And it is a RAID Z pool with each VDEV has three members. Although I haven't had my morning caffeine yet, and I use the RAID Z and the mirror VDEV keywords. Uh, there it is. So I made a typo. If I add minus F, ZFS will say, so you wish to shoot yourself in the foot. I'm OK with this plan. Here you go. And you, you can't. ZFS will not handle well different types of virtual device in the same pool. If you, find your, if you use the minus F anyway, you will start to get errors because it's trying to do two different things in the same pool. And you'll go searching for forum posting and mailing list posting saying, how do I fix this? And you will be told, destroy the pool and start over, restore from backup. 
Now you know. There is one place where it is okay to use minus F, and that's if you are recycling disks. You made a pool, you destroy a pool, you want to create a new pool. And ZFS marks the disks so that uh, it, each disk has a label that says what pool it is in. So if you know the pool is not in use, or the disk is not in use, go ahead and use minus F, because you really do intend to reuse this disk. So once you've created your pools, you can view them. Here I've got a system uh, I use zpool list on. I have a db pool that contains my data. I have a zroot pool, which is the traditional ZFS uh, root pool for the operating system. Or I could use zpool list minus v and get all the details which is, is worth doing now and then on your system just to learn what normal looks like. So, let's talk about pool integrity for a moment. Pardon me. ZFS is self-healing at the pool and at the VDEV label. Basically, every block is hashed repeatedly. There are checksums everywhere on everything. And ZFS is laid out as a tree. Uh, and the hash of each child block is stored in the parent. So. ZFS has this concept of a scrub, which is start at the root of the tree, walk down the tree, compute, look, get the hashes for every block on the disk. Compute the hash of every block on the disk. Make sure that things match up. If something doesn't match, look around, rebuild the block from parity, figure out where the problem is, and restore it. So it, how many of you have had a, say, an, a, an, a JPEG go bad because of an error on the disk? You have, you know, half the picture looks great and the other half looks like garbage. This always happens with, like, your kid's wedding pictures or, you know, the newborn baby or, you know, you know that, that hated relative's funeral where you want that one last picture. You know, the, the important things. So ZFS automatically handles all of that for you. If you have a virtual device that is not redundant, if you're using a Stripe for your laptop, we'll talk about copies proper, we'll talk about properties later. But the copies property says, keep an extra copy of everything. Which, yes, it cuts your storage space in half if you tell it to keep two copies. But when ZFS detects an error, it can compare the copies, figure out which is correct, and heal it. So if we have 10 terabyte hard drives, I have no idea what you're doing with that space, so set copies. Now, I hear objections now and then about scrub versus FSIC. How many of you know and love FSIC? Okay. Don't, love is a strong. How many of you know and love FSIC? more than you know and love S FSDB and CLRI file system debuggers. We, we have some FSDB fans in here. Awesome. Uh, 
ZFS has no offline on integrity checker. You don't shut down the, the file system to check it. It does all of this live. And, and there's a certain, if you've run Unix for a while, there's a certain gut level feeling that no, you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't preen live file systems. They're live. Stuff is happening on them. You should, you should quiet the, the file system and, and check it in peace so you know that it's clean and pristine, polished to a high gleam before you take it back out on the road where some stupid gravel truck throws something up and dings it. But uh, that, that's just not the case with ZFS. A ZFS scrub does everything FSIC does and more. It is possible to offline your pool and scrub it. I mean, it, it's a Unix system. You can take the file system offline if you want. Uh, offline scrub won't help, but you can do it. And there are lots of little nitpicks against scrub and things that it possibly could not find. But the truth is, all of those issues and more apply to FSIC. Back in the day, way back when, and Mr. O'Connor probably remembers these days, uh, when UFS was a new thing and FSIC was a new thing, there were objections to FSIC. How can you possibly have an automated program check a file system? You need the human hand to go and use FSDB to debug the file system and CLRI to wipe away unneeded inodes. And sysadmins are, are this perverse blend of bleeding edge and conservative. Uh, we, we tend to, be, to, to treat our file systems as the precious things they are. But Scrub is a better thing than FSIC. So, pool properties. Properties are tunables or values. Both pools and data sets have properties. To play with properties on a pool, you'll use zpool get and zpool set. Some of these are read-only, some are calculated by a pool's characteristics, and some of them you can change. For example, this pool size is a property. You cannot change the size of your pool by toggling a software setting. Uh, we do not yet have software that makes additional disk appear. On the other hand, a tunable like bootfs here, this is pointing at zroot root default. This is where your root file system is. You could change that and boot from an alternate root. And here we'd use zpool set to make a, a couple minor changes. A pool can have a comment saying what the pool is for, perhaps. Or perhaps it says, Craig, don't touch this. Whatever. And here we set that copies property I talked about to two. There's your laptop redundancy. So does, if you do that, does it go and make a second copy? If it had sent the one before, does it go and make a second copy of everything? You do? Good question. Um, Properties only take effect on newly written data. So if you want to set copies equals two on your laptop, you need to do that in the install before it's written to disk. Or you can decide, you know, I don't care about the base OS files. I would just restore those from media, but I care about my pictures and my game scores. So. That you, you set that immediately upon install before copying anything over. A, another useful thing is the pool history. ZFS records 
every action that changes the pool. It doesn't record when you run zpool get, when you're just looking, who cares? But it records every time you run zpool set, it records every time you create a data set, it records every time you change something. This is incredibly useful. Uh, more than once in my corporate life, I came into work and there was some flunky who came running up to me and said, oh my God, everything has gone terrible and I don't know what happened. And there is the cynical and experienced part of me that says, no, you know exactly what happened. Because when I was you, I knew exactly what happened and there was no way I was going to fess up. <laughs> so, Z-Pool history you can even read the history off of a destroyed pool. So, once you've dealt with the problem, you can look at the pool and say, okay, you don't know what happened. But the pool history shows that five minutes after you came in, this command was run on this pool. And can you tell me how that happened? That's an, an important, uh, uh, let's just say that I'm really glad that today's new and upcoming sysadmins have more accountability than we had back in the day. So, destroy a pool. Z pool destroy, boom, gone. You can reuse the disks. Okay, let's talk about feature flags. ZFS has a, a whole panoply of features, nifty things it can do. And when Sun was in charge of ZFS, ZFS had version numbers. And every time they added a new feature, they cranked the version number, like you do. And then Oracle. So, the final Oracle ZFS was version 28. They may or may not have had further versions internal to Oracle, but the, the open ZFS story ends with Oracle ZFS version 28. But remember how ZFS is developed. You have the open ZFS body and you have all of these contributing bodies and, and consumers and developers sending stuff up and down. And while OpenZFS is a clearinghouse and an, and an arbiter, they're, they're kind of like the computer science research group back at Berkeley in the day. So how were they going to keep all this straight? Well, they cranked the version number to 5,000. That was to give Oracle lots of room so they could continue to develop ZFS in-house because we're nice people that way, not that Oracle would ever let Sun die. So, and, and they deployed this thing called feature flags. Basically, a feature flag is a way that the pool can say, this is stuff I support. So, get all Z root and just grep for feature. Each of these things is a feature that is available in ZFS version 5000 or later. So, you can, assuming that you are putting ZFS on raw disk and you're not using an LLVM or a FreeBSD crypto layer or, or something to put it on, you can take, you, you can look at the, the feature flags that are live on your pool compare them to the feature flags available on another host, even in another operating system. And provided all the features are supported, you can pick up those disks from one OS to the other. And they're good to go. 
You can also enable and disable features. For example, here you'll see this particular feature is enabled, where this one is active. Active means that there is data written to disk using this feature. Active me or enabled means we've turned this feature on, but nothing's actually written with it. So you could turn this feature off and move it to an OS that doesn't support that feature. Okay. How are we for time? Datasets. A data set is a named chunk of data. It could be a file system, could be a volume, which is a, a, a lump of stuff for, say, a virtual machine. It's block storage. It could be a snapshot, a clone, or a bookmark. Properties and features work on a da per data set basis. The rule with ZFS, lots of data sets. So here we have just some samples. We see how much is used, available, and where it's mounted. You might notice that we seem to have four root data sets. Well, we have the mount point, but three of those are not actually mounted. So you would create a data set on an existing system with ZFS create. Here, uh, the first one I created is this uh, a data set just for MySQL. Now, if you have a complicated MySQL database, you might want data sets under there for certain of your databases. And I've used this minus V to say create a ZFS volume, which is a lump of block storage. You can run UFS on ZFS in a virtual machine and have a self-healing UFS that the VM never notices. You can run Windows in a virtual machine and have the file system self-heal, which there are times I would have given a kidney for that. I mean, not, not mine, but someone's. <laughs> Move data sets by renaming them. Destroy data sets with... Uh, ZFS destroy. When you're destroying, a couple useful flags, these work anywhere, but they're particularly important when you're destroying. Minus V is verbose mode, and minus N is a no-op. Combined, they say, if I was really to destroy this data set, what would I really be destroying? Uh, because ZFS destroy can be kind of like, you know, RM minus RF, and well, let, let's let's be sure what we're doing here. It's basically like doing a dry run. It's a dry run, exactly. ZFS property. It's a per data set characteristic, much like Z pools. I'm I'm not going into detail that because they, you're all pretty smart people. One place where ZFS is a little different is the parent-child relationships. Data sets inherit their parents' properties. So you can say, set a certain type of compression on home directories and set a different type of compression on var log, but then have uh, data sets beneath var log, say var log MySQL, and set those child data sets will inherit the parent settings unless you change them. So if you change the parent, the change propagates immediately through all of the children. Renaming a data set changes its parent and changes its inheritance. So Mounting and unmounting ZFS. The ZFS mount command, not your regular mount command. There is a mount point property. So you can say, I want my old MySQL data set mounted, but I, I want it on slash mount. So, 
pool repair and maintenance. Resilvering is the term that they use for rebuilding from parity. Resilvering uses the VDEV redundancy data, like we talked about with scrubs. If there's no redundancy, there's no resilvering. The catch with repairs is, as you might guess, they're throttled by disk I.O. When you replace a disk, resilvering happens automatically. Remember, you add VDEVs to pools, not disks to VDEVs. One thing to watch out for, not all 10 terabyte disks are the same size. If you look carefully at the box, it'll say how many sectors are actually on the disk. If you have a disk die and you try to replace it with a disk that is you know, two sectors smaller, nope, there's not enough room. So pay careful attention to the actual size of your disks. So you can add a VDEV to a pool, for example. Here I have our, our scratch pool. It is a, uh, that it's just a stripe. I want more space. Stick another disk in. Fine, stripe it. Here I have my database mirror pool. And I'm adding two more disks as a mirror VDEV. And here I have a RAID Z1 pool <coughs> called DB. And I'm adding three disks, making that pool larger. So, hardware. The important thing is st in storage is that disks are terrible. They will die. The only question is when will it be least convenient? And that's the time. <laughs> so, ZFS shows hardware in, in several different states. Online is working normally. A degraded VDAV has something, one of the disks is kaput is dead. Do something. A faulted disk is generating too many errors. Your RAID controller and its proprietary gunk, that will hide faulted. So you want to know when that disk starts generating errors so you can, uh, you can replace it at a time that is convenient to you, not that's convenient to the disk. An unavailable disk it can't be opened. Maybe it's unplugged. Who knows? Offline disk, you turned it off. Turn it back on, you idiot. And removed means that the hardware has detected a drive has been removed. So here's how this might look in production. I have a host here, free NAS box. It recently did a scrub, took 15 hours and 57 minutes. These are some really big disks. But here, we have two disks that are unavailable. This RAID Z2 device is degraded, so the pool it is in is degraded. And now hopefully, when you put together your big storage array, you kept track of disk serial numbers and what tray they're in, or how your host maps uh, device IDs or labels to the physical array. There's lots of ways to do that. I don't care what you use, just use one of them. So. And, and now that I've shown this example, uh, John, if you're watching the video, you really ought to look at this host and fix those two disks. Thank you very much. So, uh, a couple neat things that you can do on ZFS that you can't do elsewhere. Log devices and cache devices. The question in high-performance storage is, where is your bottleneck? 
And sysadmin in a performance setting is all about arranging your bottlenecks. Sometimes it's like rearranging the deck chairs on the Lusitania, but we do the best we can. A read cache, what they call an L2 arc, is you all know how your host will store in memory the files that are most recently accessed. And up until it uses all the memory it's allowed and then too bad. A read cache is a very fast drive, usually an SSD, that is used as a layer two read cache. It's stuff that is used often enough to almost go in memory, but not quite. So you can keep that as, as a, a handy fast copy. Similarly, a write log, ZFS intent log or a slog. Suppose your database is quiet most of the time, but every so often you get hammered with an amount, with an insane amount of data. Well, a write log is kind of like a write cache on a hard drive. You put a really fast device in and say, just dump it here. And when, when the rush is over, you can more slowly, at a speed that the main system can affect, move it off of that device and into the main pool. So don't just buy these arbitrarily. Look at your system. Do performance testing. See what you need. Yes, Kip. So I had a vendor of creating me, so everything you can buy our thing, and it's like caching, right? Yep. So don't most file systems, most systems nowadays already have some level of caching to the disk? Most file systems already have some level of caching to disk, absolutely. Uh, journaling, etc. The catch is, if you have a storage array, you don't want to buy, well, we would all love to buy the fastest disks available on the market. We would all love screaming fast storage. Uh, in reality, we have to make some trade-offs. And what a cache like this allows you to do is you buy fair speed main storage. And you can, you can save a huge amount of money by not buying the top-of-the-line fastest drives. And then buy a smaller device that is screaming fast and use that as the cache. So the application sees that your storage is screaming fast. And the system behaves as if the storage is screaming fast. But you didn't spend the money. And, and personally, I want to spend money on important things, which is, you know, people, pizza, um, you know, or things like that. Pizza, right. So I guess the question is, you know, is this something really unique to ZFS, or is there really a lot of other systems out there that do this kind of thing? There are proprietary systems that do things like this. Generally speaking, ZFS does it better and faster. This is, and this, is tiered storage. this is this is tiered storage. So so these caching devices, a lot of times they're gonna be RAM. Right? Oh yes, a lot of caching so devices are RAM. RAM. Which is orders of magnitude faster than your fastest disk. Yes. And then you got fast disks as and your let's call it tier one. And then you got average disks as right. the rest of your So th this is this is an approach at tiered storage. Go take a look at some benchmarks that are not produced by vendors and see how ZFS stacks up against them. I still got to believe that a, a RAM is going to be miles ahead of your fastest. RAM is going to be miles ahead of your fastest write to disk, yes, until you pull the plug. Sure. But if you have that much RAM, I mean, it. we can go around for hours on how to stack all of this. Just, it's, it's a tool. Don't go buying it blindly, but if you need it, you'll be really grateful it's there. So, this built-in file system compression. 
compression exchanges CPU time for disk I.O. And on most systems, disk I.O. is the limiting bottleneck. That's where everything slows to a crawl. It's getting stuff on and off of storage. CPU time, we, we, this laptop has like 87 cores. I don't even know anymore. Uh, I don't count. There, we have all the processor time we could want. So we, I'm happy to make this trade because uh, ZFS's default compression algorithm, LZ4, is very good at detecting when data is compressible and when it's not. You don't want the file system trying to compress your binaries. There's no advantage there. You do want the file system compressing your text log file, so. Because you can fit 10 times as much of that onto the disk if you can shrink it by a factor of 10. Always enable, com if, if you want to play with compression, it's on by default, but if you want to play with it, Enable it before writing the data. ZFS will not go through and rewrite old data. For some cases, gzip is better than LZ4. I was responsible for a system that had like 15 years of phone call records. And fairly small files, all plain text, only accessed when something went annoyingly wrong. And GZIP9 got us an extra 25% on that, if I recall correctly. So there's no more user land log compression. The file system does it. Move on. So if you had to, if you had to move a file yep. somewhere else that had been uh, LZ4 on a disk, as soon as you read it, Yes. You, have to, you have to recompress it at that time to, to move it and send it away. <coughs> you know I mean? it's, it's Depends on how you're moving it. Are you moving it within the same data set? No, I'm giving or, it to the Russians or something. You're, you're <laughs> giving it to the Russians. <laughs> yeah, you uncompress <laughs> and decompress. But yeah. the yeah, but CPU. CPU time is infinite. Okay, but you, do, you would certainly have to do it, though. You'd have to pipe it through a uh, yes. Well, you would not. The file system does it for you. The file system auto compresses, auto decompresses. You don't even have to worry about it anymore. Underneath the cover, you just say, "Oh, take this file system, go to that destination, it'll uncompress it internally, and the uh, uh, uncompressed yep. will appear at the target. And if that's another ZFS setup." Well, it'll no, do its thing no, to transmitted uncompressed data, and that transmission is going to be the thing on Earth. If you want to, you should compress data in transit. Mm -hmm. But that's, but that's, a, different that, that's, a, that's a different thing, and we, you pipe it through gzip and pipe that to SSH and get on with your life. Mm -hmm. The benefit is you're, you're smaller than you like. Yes. The expansion is happening. Yes. And uh, some. Which is why I was just going to share that typically when you're getting a server and you know you're going to run ZFS, you have <coughs> choices. Oh, I take this one, it's cheaper, um, you know, eight cores, whatever, and we'll throw in some fancy tensor. Or take this other one, might have, you know, same amount of cores, but if it's a higher clock rate, I prefer that. The memory, you know, it's not that much, but because a lot of CPU uh, power is available, that'll actually perform better, even with less memory. Yes. Maxwell gig versus 256 gig, but if you have twice as fast, same number of cores, higher clock speed, go for that. And it actually might be cheaper. So if I just, uh, you know, so I just want to make sure I understand. So if I'm copying a file from LZ4 to a GZIP9. Yep. Yep. CPUs are totally safe. Nobody can look into a CPU, right? 
That's absolutely correct. CPUs are bulletproof. So. And yes, encryption is separate. Compression. If if you can take a 10 meg file and shrink it to 5 meg before you write it to disk, that file gets read and written twice as fast. Okay, but so, so don't don't encryption usually compress as well? No. No, not no. Really. no encryption and compression have nothing to do with each other. It's a different matter that the compressed file looks like encrypted to you. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, but they're separate. So, similarly, while disk I.O. is the scarcest resource, uh, memory is slightly limited. And if you're reading these text files that you have gzip compressed down into almost black hole density, well, why not store them in RAM the same way? You can vastly improve the amount of the amount of disk style storage that you have cached in the CPU if you compress that so the the ZFS arc the their buffer cache if you will does that for you it's just automatic let's some um, one feature that gets touted on ZFS is deduplication, where if you have identical blocks on disk, you could merge them into one block and keep track of it. Um, most data is not ZFS deduplicable. You, you get some benefit, but not much at all. And there, there are some uh, deduplication also increases uh, the amount of memory you need to use a pool. So, generally speaking, I have never seen a ZFS pool where deduplication was really useful. It is theoretically possible that you could have data that could be deduplicated and it might be worth it, and it's conceivable, but uh, who knows? What's the block size on that? 128K by default. Smaller block sizes. Smaller block sizes would be more deduplicable. But these are modern disks. So let's talk about snapshots with copy and write. Uh, and we've gone over an hour, so I'm going to skim through these just a, a little bit. Copy on write means that you never overwrite an existing allocated block. You always allocate a new block. So ZFS basically has a ledger. And you can say, I want a snapshot of this file system. And when you snapshot it, ZFS lists every block that is in that file system. And it will, when you overwrite, when you want to change a block and it allocates a new block, it just changes the accounting in the ledger. Let's say that old block with the old version is now allocated to this snapshot. So you have a 100 gig file system and you take a snapshot and you change one gig worth of data. The, the live file system is still 100 gig. Your snapshot is one gig because it only contains what changed. Getting rid of this snapshot is very easy because you just go to the ledger and say, throw, away, throw that away. So, and snapshots are why, why you would want to use the minus VN. So it's, for ZFS, snapshots are just bookkeeping. And I got ahead of my slides, but it's, it's cool stuff. Would that protect against the ransomware stuff? 
Yes, there are many articles on how ZFS protects against ransomware. And basically, all you do for that is look at the next slide. Not this one, the, the one we're going to. Um, the catch with snapshots, suppose your, di your disk is getting full, you want to clean up some space, you go in your home directory, you, you, oh, you have all these old ISOs, you throw them out. But weirdly, no space is filled up, or no space is freed up. It's because those blocks are still in use by the snapshots of that data set. So you have to go and be careful in, in, in what you store and what you snapshot. Because blocks are only freed once no snapshot uses them. For ZFS rollback, suppose you're using ZFS to back your office file store and one of these ransomware programs comes through and encrypts the whole thing. Um, you can restore that with the ZFS rollback command. And just roll back to the most recent unaffected snapshot and boom, the Windows admins owe you beer. Uh, wait until they have fixed the virus problem before rolling back or you're going to be rolling right back again. And, and a nifty side effect of this is a clone. A snapshot is read-only. It's a, it's a photo of time, of, of a, a point in time. But a clone is basically build a read-write file system on top of that snapshot. So here, I have, I've taken a snapshot of today's MySQL database. I want to test the new version of our software. I clone that snapshot. I run the new version. I run the upgrade. I'm only using that small amount of space for the difference between the live data, the snapshot, and the clone. So if the test goes horribly wrong, no harm. I file my bug report and throw out the clone. Who cares? Another nifty thing is boot environments. It's built on clones and snapshots. Basically, you, it, a boot environment snapshots your root data set with all your binaries before you upgrade. You run the upgrade. Everything is great, no problem. Things go horribly wrong, you roll back. The nice thing about boot environments is you can keep them around. How many of you have had an upgrade go bad, but you didn't realize for days or weeks just how vile and insidious it was? <laughs> you have a month-old boot environment. Now, you, you'll want to take steps to protect your database data or what have you, be, and, but you can at least get the OS back to something that wasn't horrendous. And the last nifty ZFS thing we're going to talk about is ZFS send receive. ZFS knows what blocks have been written since a snapshot. How many of you use rsync to synchronize? Okay, it's everywhere. You fire up your rsync job. And on your local host, it goes through and it compares all the files and it's looking at... Um, uh, M times, usually, or depending on how you configured it, some, some other characteristic. And it picks up everything that's changed and it shoots it over and it pounds on that disk. ZFS knows what blocks have been written. So you synchronize two hosts. Initially, there, there's nothing for it. If you want to, if you want to move your 100 gigs of data and replicate on another host, you, you have to suck it up and move 100 gigs of data. But then after that, say you have a, a daily synchronization job, 
ZFS knows all of the blocks that have been written since that last snapshot you sent. And instead of walking the file system to figure out what it needs, it just goes, here's my list of blocks. Send those. And, and that's it. Another nice feature with this is it's resumable. If you are halfway through your 100 gig transfer and someone cuts the cable, you, you don't have to resend what was already sent. You can pick up where you left off. So this really blows our sync out of the water for any kind of performance related work. As I, you know, remember, disk I.O. is the most precious resource. Our sync eats it. So I'd like to open the floor for questions. Don't ask me about the, the differences between the, the Open Solaris, CDDL, and the GPL, because damned if I know. Um, I, I'm going to do one thing before taking questions, which, um, dear IRS, my drive out here and dinner is now tax deductible. Thank you very much. There, see, there, there's books. You, you, you might like some of them. So, any questions? Yes, sir. Does it uh, build tools across servers, multiple hosts? No, not multiple hosts. There are add-on ways to do that. And if you're doing something like HAST or some of the other networked mirrored storage, you can certainly put those on top of ZFS. Yes, sir. You can do a read-only mount. Um, you can't. You can use tools like FSDB. Uh, sorry, not FSDB. Um, ZDB. And walk in and start looking, and you will discover that ZFS has these things called Z nodes that look an awful lot like really fat I nodes. And you can backtrace what files go to what and what blocks they are and when they were touched. So it is really not that different. And if you want to look at it from a, a user level, it mount it read only just as you would really anything else. We head over here. I just have one last question about uh, so and this might be really simple and stupid. Um, you mentioned obviously looking at disk size when replacing uh, because you wouldn't have a disk that you had today. Right. But let's say you replace it with a bigger disk temporarily to match the Oh, fit. you're fine. But what I'm saying well, is, is like, will, so let's say you want to keep an inventory that's like the same across or relatively right. the same. Will it grow or will it just? Oh, it, no, it, it will use the smallest disk okay. you have in the pool. Yeah, yeah, they they either thought of that ahead of time or they caught on real quick. There are ways to grow the disks to say, use the extra space, but you have to give that command. And, and that's how you would say, if you want to upgrade a pool in place, say you have a, a pool of one gig, one terabyte disks and you want to replace them with 10 terabytes, you fail one disk, you plug in the 10 terabyte, resilver, say grow that disk, okay. fail the next disk. It's, it's tedious, but it's a lot more possible than other OSs. And, and I think we're going to take a break. We're going to take a quick break. And let folks vote. Yeah. Um, I nominate Craig for everything. Oh yes, this is all live. There's no taking it off to resilver. We 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 don't play that. Okay.
All righty. Thank you. Let's do this real quick. Thank you very much. And hopefully we can get back to the next presentation. Um, so, Mr. McClellan, do you want to take the lead on this? Sure. All right. I don't think we have any nominations that I've seen. Uh, one nomination, I nominate myself. But I also say we nominate the uh, existing board as is. It's usually what we've done in the past. The existing board is, uh, is uh, nominated. So okay. If you want to nominate, I'll second the nomination. So that, let's do that. Right. Here to four. Second. Does anybody else want to run? I'd like to encourage uh, anybody else who would like to run. Don't feel, uh, too don't feel steamrollered. Don't, yeah, don't feel steamrollered. House. Yes. Uh, at dinner, discuss business. We're done by 8:30, 9 o'clock, typically. Typically, yeah. Um, <coughs> so. All right. Any other nominations? Okay. Well then. Well, this makes it easy. If we yes. Have, we basically have, we have six positions on the board. Yes. Uh, we do not vote for who's president, vice president, all that kind of stuff. It's just members at large. Yeah. Uh, amongst the board, we kind of roll, uh, dole out what the responsibilities are, and I don't expect that to change. Uh, so, with six positions open and six nominees running, do we are all six of us running? I, don't, I, I am running. Yes. So the shies have it. <laughs> yeah. We accept the fact that all six nominees are re-elected to the board of directors. Uh, okay. Vote for the current slate. Aye. 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 All righty. Nobody's going to miss it. Yep. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so that was simple. Yes. So Very simple. Thank you. Thank you all. And welcome uh, our 2018 to 2019 board. Yeah. Okay. Let's get back to Ed. Let's get back to Ed if we. Yes. Uh, Michael, do we have enough time for Ed? Oh yeah. Okay. I didn't want to cut you off completely at the legs. It's supposed to be a shorter talk. Excellent. This is uh, just a reminder too. Uh, while we're getting everything reset up again, uh, we have our comment cards. We do collect these at the end of the meeting. Uh, if you would, uh, you know. Put, put how you felt about the meeting, any comments you have about the meeting as well. Um, come back on up. If you would. If you, if you actually move the data on the disk from one data set to another, it copies the data. If you rename it within the same data set, ZFS is lazy and just changes the, the, the label. Right. Then you move it. Yep. Right. Well, the file name will be written twice. Point to the same sectors. 
Yeah. So, because it's it's something you wrote new. ZFS does not care. It is like the honey badger. Okay. Sure, one more ZFS question. of it is written that does not have that those blocks in it and then the old index node node is discarded or kept a snapshot or what have you. So what's kind of the sweet spot to not let your file system get up to as far as amount used copy on right? You want to keep it below 80, 90, or that's another great discussion topic. And it, the short answer is, it depends. I keep mine under 90. I, I use a trick called a reservation, which is I, I block off 10% of the disk and say you can't write to it. So that when my disk hits that 90% point, it's not actually full. I just have a, a real hard warning that, that I need to look at it and throw out the most snapshot. Your, your enterprise, of course, has a fully functional battle station network monitoring system that will tell you when the disks are filling up.